Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to help you fall asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Creepy Backwoods Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. So, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. It was a random day. My family and I had a trip planned out to go somewhere far from home, just to go to a place in the Philippines called Dahilian Bukidon Park. While on the way, we used a GPS tracker to reach our destination. None of us were aware that the GPS may not be accurate. We followed the route. My uncle was driving the car. It was a fortune car, big enough to fit many people inside. As we got somewhere, it was still sunset, and we were going up a hill surrounded by tall trees. I fell asleep for a while because I was already exhausted from all the journey that we went through. But I soon woke up from my mother's voice saying, Dong Pag Bante Kai Mahulag Ta. It's in Kibano. It meant, be careful, we're going to fall off. I looked around the car window. We were on top of a hill. The sides of the road being so thin and tight. One wrong turn and we would all come crashing down. My cousins and I were at the back of the car. We stayed quiet because we knew not to panic at situations like these. But my mom was the only one panicking. As we went further, my uncle drove slowly and thankfully we didn't fall off and managed to find an area that we could make a U-turn. It was still on the hill, but the area was wide enough. After making it back to the main road safely, we were all shaken and scared. Time skipped to hours of driving. After that, it was already night. Nothing in sight. No lights, and it was nothingness. My family didn't follow the GPS at this time. They used their memory, because they used to be on that road before. We were going uphill again. I had no idea where it was. But all I saw was trees around the car, and the quiet sound of the car wheels driving over the gravel. Then at some point we stopped. I was confused, but it appeared that there was no continuation of the road ahead. Everyone in the car was quiet. My mother asked my uncle to check outside. When they opened the car door, it was so cold. The wind was strong and I heard the trees. It was spooky and sent a chill down my spine. My uncle closed the door as he turned on the front lights of the car. There was a line of people. Many of them. I don't have any idea what they were doing alone in the woods. It was so weird. After that, I fell asleep from exhaustion. I didn't eat all day because we were stranded in the woods. The next thing I know, I woke up and we were already in the main road and stopped by a 7-Eleven shop and they bought hot dogs for my cousins and I to eat. All of us were starving and had no energy. This was the closest experience that I ever had of dying. I'm glad that my family and I were safe. Just a reminder, if you want to go somewhere, you can't always trust the GPS or the maps because the routes are outdated. My fiancé and I went for a three-day trip to Gatlinburg, and we've spent our days in the mountains, hiking, and spending time in and around the National Park. Tonight at around midnight, trying to get all of the time in the mountains that we can, we decided to take an hour drive from our hotel room up the mountain to an overview slash lookout type of spot, right on top of said mountain, to see if we can catch an awesome look at the stars 
because there's a lot of lights in Gatlinburg at night. Driving up there, neither of us notice literally anything off, other than when the mountain winds are a little spooky at night. We're from Florida, so it's just unfamiliar. But as soon as we get to where we were going, and she and I got out of my car, I'm almost overwhelmed with a vile, oppressive feeling outside of me. But not wanting to make the lady uncomfortable, I don't react too much just yet. The wind is absolutely roaring, and unfortunately, we couldn't see any stars due to cloud cover. So I tell her I'm going to step to the side and pee, and then we can get back to the hotel room. As soon as I get like 10 feet away, I get a very strange feeling of extreme vulnerability and detachment from everything around me, almost as though I'm miles away from my nearest person, though obviously I'm only feet away from my fiancé. I turned around to walk back to the car and heard something off to my right and instinctively looked over to see something roughly human size go down to coyote size and just kind of hop over a rail from about 200 maybe more feet away. I quickly get back to the car and usher my fiance in, still not trying to scare her, or at least show her that I'm scared, but she asked if I was alright, and my reaction was a dead giveaway, and we jumped in and sped off. Never in my life have I had an experience like this before. And never in my life have I really had a reason to be made uncomfortable of just being outside. But I truly believe that something was in those woods with us tonight. Hey everyone. I've been lurking here for a while and thought I'd share a strange experience from about seven years ago that's been haunting me ever since. I've been a trucker for over a decade, and you hear all sorts of stories on the road, but this one still gives me chills. I was driving through a particularly desolate stretch of highway in the Midwest when I decided to pull over at a truck stop for the night. The place was pretty run down, and there were only a few other trucks parked there. As I was getting ready to settle in, I overheard a couple of guys talking near one of the trucks. They seemed on edge, whispering urgently. I caught snippets of their conversation and heard one of them say, watch out for the lizards. I thought it was a weird thing to say, but didn't think much of it at the time. I figured it was some local slang or an inside joke. As the night wore on, I started to drift off, but then I heard footsteps crunching on the gravel outside. It was strange because it didn't sound like just one person. It was like a small group was walking around, but the pattern was irregular and unsettling. Curiosity got the better of me, so I peeked out of my window. I couldn't see much in the dim light, but there were definitely figures moving around the parking area. They seemed to be skulking between the trucks, almost like they were looking for something. I told myself it was probably just other drivers stretching their legs, but the unease wouldn't go away. Suddenly, I heard a sharp knock on my door. My heart leapt into my throat. I glanced at the clock. It was well past midnight. I called out asking who it was, but there was no response. Just the sound of footsteps shuffling away. At this point, I was too spooked to investigate further, so I locked my doors and tried to get some sleep. Just as I was drifting off again, I heard a low hissing sound coming from somewhere nearby. It was faint but persistent, like someone whispering just out of earshot. I squeezed my eyes shut and told myself it was my imagination, but then I heard the footsteps again, closer this time. Throughout the night, I could hear knocks and scratches on the other trucks around me. Every once in a while, there was some sort of yelling or moaning coming from the distance like someone or something was trying to communicate or call out. Occasionally, a smoky smell like a cigarette would waft through the air when these creatures were close to my truck. The rest of the night was a blur of eerie sounds and creeping dread. I kept telling myself it was just some weird local prank, but the whole thing felt off. 
As soon as the first light of dawn broke, I didn't waste a second. I fired up my truck and got out of there without even looking back. I didn't want to see what might have been left in the morning. To this day, I can't shake the feeling that there was something more to those lizards than meet the eye. Maybe it was just an overactive imagination. Or maybe there was something out there in the backwoods truck stops that we're better off not knowing about. Stay safe out there and keep your eyes and ears open. You never know what might be lurking in the dark. To start this off, I need to give some context. I'm 23, and I currently live in New York City, but I have grandparents who live down in rural West Virginia. When I say rural, I mean the literal boonies. Their closest neighbors are over an hour away, in a small town with a few houses and a Walmart. Last summer, my grandfather, who I'll just call Robert for privacy reasons, had a surgery done on his hip. The majority of my family lives on the West Coast, and my grandmother, who I'll just refer to as Muriel, is very old and wouldn't have been able to take care of Robert. Because I was the closest family member, I was the only one they asked to come down there and help out my grandfather. Being the good grandson I am, I agreed to come down there for two weeks while he recovered from his surgery. Fast forward a week, everything was going fine. All I really had to do was help my grandfather up and down the stairs and walk his dog, a blue healer named Rocky. Normally, my grandfather would walk Rocky once in the morning and once at night through the woods behind their property. But because of his surgery, that responsibility fell onto me. This was the part that I hated about helping him, because ever since I was a kid, I never liked those woods behind this property. Whenever I'd go down there as a kid, me and my cousins would always get creeped out going into that forest. It always just felt off for some reason. Anyways, for the first week, walking Rocky in the forest at night was fine, even if a bit creepy. That was until one night, a week into my stay, I was walking him through the forest. It was around 8.30 and the sun was setting over the Appalachian Mountains. Everything was going normal until I heard a strange whistle that sounded like it was only around 20 yards away. Both me and the dog stopped dead in our tracks and looked towards the direction the whistling came from. I shined my flashlight in the direction, but I didn't see anything, so I had just assumed that it was a bird. Looking back, it definitely wasn't a bird. There's no nocturnal birds that chirp and whistle out there and it sounded more musical than anything a bird would whistle. But the dog was spooked. He wouldn't stop growling and staring at whatever was back there, and he kept trying to get back up until whatever, or whoever, that thing was whistled again. To which, the dog started barking and going crazy. At this point, I decided that I definitely didn't want to stay there, so I yanked on the dog's leash, and we both bolted out of the woods and straight back home. When we got back and I told my grandparents what happened, they both seemed spooked, and my grandmother immediately asked if I whistled back. I told her that I didn't, and she seemed relieved, but told me that I didn't hear anything and to just ignore it. I asked why, and she wouldn't tell me, and would instead just tell me that I didn't hear anything. I decided to not press it any further and I went to bed, terrified, and wondering what she seemed so freaked out about. The next morning, she told me that instead of walking Rocky through the woods, I should just take him on laps around the house. So that's what I started doing. Every night, I would take Rocky for around 50 laps around the house before going back inside. On Friday, the third to last day I would be there, at night, I was taking the dog for laps as usual, until I heard that same creepy whistle behind the attached garage which was only around 10 yards from the house. This time, I immediately took the dog back inside and locked the doors. The rest of the night, I put my earbuds in and ignored the whistling, like my grandmother told me to do. To this day, I still don't know what was whistling in those woods. 
Some of my friends said that it was a skinwalker. But that's a Navajo thing, and there's almost no Navajo in West Virginia. My girlfriend, who stayed back in New York City, asked her Muslim parents who are from Yemen, and they said that whistling at night is a sign that a djinn is nearby. I don't know what that is, but whatever it was had my grandparents legitimately scared. I've heard of weird stuff happening in Appalachia, but this is the first time I've ever had an experience with it firsthand. Does anyone have any idea what this could have been? In high school, during a quiet summer night, me and two friends went to investigate a local ghost road. It was rumored to have a ghost lady who would appear carrying a couple of bags, then dematerialize in front of you. The road has fields, woods, and houses spread out, but by no means did it feel remote or creepy during the day. We pulled the little pickup truck to the side of the road, turned the engine off, and just sat quietly with the windows down. The cool night air felt perfect. We were still talking like normal about life and girlfriends, and really just half paying attention to the dark road that stretches out away from us. Then I saw something. Here's what I saw. During a lolling conversation, I looked up to see the silhouette of three to four foot tall humanoid shadow walking down the opposite side of the street no more than 40 feet away. I didn't say anything, but I stared in disbelief. It looked like if a Muppet had been walking. No sooner than I saw this thing, it walked through a darker shadow cast by a nearby tree in the moonlight and emerged out the other end of the shadow looking like a normal house cat. It was no longer upright, but was distinctly a cat. It walked a few more steps, looked at us, and silently bound over the guardrail and into the woods directly opposite us. From the small, weird two-foot walker to the cat over by the guardrail probably only took no more than five seconds in total. I said nothing the entire time. Strangely, nobody did. Then the driver said to nobody in particular, Oh, it's just a cat. I said, wait. I saw the small person, too. We just looked at each other, took the cue, and headed home. This was almost 30 years ago now. The area has gotten substantially more built up with the new homes and such. I think about this from time to time. I wonder if it was my eyes playing tricks on me. But it is noteworthy that somebody else in the vehicle saw the same thing at the same time. This is one of my desert stories. They are all true, with the given disclaimer that I am only human and have made mistakes in perception and judgment the same as the rest of us. I don't drink booze to more than a light buzz most of the time, and have only blacked out once early in my teens. I don't really mess with weed, and avoid hallucinogens. Deserts are inherently kind of otherworldly places, even if you call one home. Dunes in particular are very odd. I know of only a few places where you can find them in my part of the world. The northernmost are the Kilpecker Dunes in the Red Desert of southern Wyoming, then to the south, Great Sand Dunes National Park in Colorado, and further south yet are the Dunes in White Sands National Park. Maybe there are others, but these are the ones I've been to, many times. They are some of the few places where I feel reasonably comfortable practicing firecraft in dry seasons. They are an amazing place to learn about what you can and can't do without, and to practice more esoteric bushcraft and survival skills. These three locations are also, by amazing coincidence, where these stories take place. I'll start here with the one I've been to the most. I grew up in a high desert. They are unforgiving by their very nature, but if you can take what they throw at you, they are full of a surprising amount of life and beauty. The forests and mountains may be my sanctuary, 
but I fear in my heart that I am ultimately a desert creature, and the dry wind that steals away warmth and moisture also calls me home. I love the desert and the winds that allow nothing spare. I love the rocky creek beds, where the bones of the fish that once gave them life blew into dust centuries ago. I love the rocky outcrops rotted away to globular non-forms by wind and ice. The desert is my home. Much like any other home, once you get used to its little tells, a sense of a place forms within you. You know when you're alone in it, when a cherished knick-knack has been moved, a door left open. Sometimes the echoes of a missing familiar sound can whisper a warning, a slight sense of offense. Sometimes, though, they can scream. The dunes of the Red Desert are not easy to get to, and depending on which part you are in, entry can be of dubious legality. I, of course, of course, would never advise going where you aren't allowed, and certainly never have in my hastier, less cautious youth. No, sir. I had been many times, and I tried to avoid camping or tooling around out there in the same spot. Alcohol was usually hauled out. Water always was and usually some lightweight means of defending oneself. But there isn't exactly a plethora of prey animals to feed a huge predatory population, so it's not really all that necessary. Somewhere around a decade ago, maybe more, maybe less, I took something of an on-again, off-again girlfriend of mine out to the Red Dunes, hopefully for a, a night of fun, if not outright debauchery. The pretense, which she later happily confirmed was pretense for her as well, was that we were there to practice air-based water collecting techniques and firecraft. I've never been much of a smooth talker, but what can I say? Hope springs eternal. I won't use any real names, but I'll refer to her by the trait I most associate with her, so let's call her Grace. It was a drive and a half, but eventually we got there, and in relative comfort. Like many young women in the Mountain West, parental worries of their daughters being stranded somewhere by buying them overbuilt SUVs with AWD and enough creature comforts to make you feel like you never left home at all. As they have the gas efficiency of a derrick fire, and Grace was nothing if not practical, she had yanked out half the seats and turned the inside into huge cargo space, including a secondary gas tank. I understand that this is not necessarily safe if done by an amateur, and is typically outside of the cab in a truck bed, but whatever, not my vehicle. Anyway, this was good, as we burned a lot of gas to get out there, and the AWD was very handy. We got there around the hottest part of the day, which in the early fall isn't so bad, and hiked out to where we wanted to set up camp. I had on occasion read about then before and decided to attempt a travoa with a couple of poles I had brought for the purpose. For the time expenditure of around 20 minutes of setup, and the purpose of dragging stuff along the sand, I got to say, not bad. I was able to haul all of our stuff out by myself around three, three and a half miles from where we parked. The dunes cover a truly huge space, and my favorite parts are of course the hardest to get to. I don't have an issue with them necessarily, but I like the dunes best when it's quiet enough to hear them sing. I don't understand it well enough to explain it. You'll have to look it up. They are what are known as living dunes, and they make a noise folks call singing. Of course, as a younger man trying in a self-aware stupid fashion to impress my date with my muscles and trying to maintain a lively conversation without revealing how winded I was. Don't judge, walking on shifting sands is hard. I wasn't listening for the singing of sand, but trying to catch what Grace was saying over the wind. This story isn't about that part anyway, but I can say, even with something of a bittersweet taste in my mouth now, that it was a pleasant time with a person I once loved, and I wouldn't have traded it for the world. We set up our camp in the nook between a few dunes, erecting a virginal handmade tent of Grace's design and manufacture, with some difficulty and good-natured swearing. It was pretty cool, a kind of low wedge designed to be erected in high wind zones and remain warm. It had a dead airspace built in, which was a pretty neat feature to my mind. Along with it, we discovered why a Dakota fire pit doesn't work well on shifting sands, which should have been obvious if either of us thought about it for more than a half second. 
and thoroughly chastised by the cruel dictates of basic physics, dug a regular fire pit like folks with functioning frontal lobes. We set up a few frames which held elevated tarps with stones in the middle, over half-buried buckets to attempt to collect dew as well. I showed her the basics, and Grace lit her first friction fire with a willow bow drill, a cottonwood baseboard, and yucca stock spindle. This is my go-to combo in the Western Steppe, BTW. In only a few tries, as the pre-dusk light show that descends every evening, known to the natives as Golden Hour, probably to everybody for all I know, rolled across the dunes and mountains of the Red Desert like so much maple syrup over harsh and unusually topographically variable pancakes. Grace and I were letting some stew cook over the fire while I showed her how to process yucca for fiber. We had a very pleasant evening, characterized by not enough stew and too much whiskey. And a song I wrote, very much not for her except in the fact that it very much was, accompanied by one of those horrible little broom-shaped traveling guitars, as is the way of the fortunes of all young idiots trying to impress women, who they should know have them dead to rights already. The B-string broke halfway through. If you can't make the object of your affection swoon, making them laugh their butts off isn't a bad consolation prize. We ended the night wrapped in a blanket by the fire, watching the moon rise and the stars do their gentle revolving dance, around Polaris until I carried her, snoring like bandsaw into her sleeping bag. I settled into mine and let the sound of the wind and the singing dunes carry me to sleep. As an aside, folks who might still benefit from this advice, take time to remind yourself to remember moments like these as they happen. They are gifts and they should be treasured as such. I rested comfortably for a while maybe an hour or two before the whiskey reminded me of the debt I now owed it, and I went to relieve myself. I was immediately taken aback by two things. One was the ludicrous brightness of the moon. Despite the residing in the red desert, the Kilpecker dunes are in fact a kind of creamy tan color, and on nights with a full moon, you might find darker conditions under a storm cloud in the middle of the day. The light seemed like it was pulsing a little, which I assume was probably more to do with dehydration and booze than the actual light sources. The second thing I noticed was the calm. It's almost always windy in Wyoming. It just is. I grew up there, walking to school in steady 40 miles per hour winds. Calm does happen, but it's usually a relative calm, like only eight miles per hour winds. This was still. Waking up to the calm is like waking up in a strange room you don't remember falling asleep in. Not inherently bad, per se, but disquieting and alien in a small but pervasive way. I climbed up a nearby dune, because if I have to urinate, I may as well do so from a great height. The men reading this will understand. And because I wanted a good view of the surrounding area, under its unusually well-illuminated conditions. The only sound was my footsteps my breath and the gentle hum of the dunes themselves. Not even an owl to be heard. As I got to the top, a mountain came into view. Actually, several did. This isn't an unusual experience in the Rockies, as visibility can often be hundreds of miles in clear conditions and farther from elevation. What was of note was that above the ones to the north of me, there were flashes and flickers of light. Thunderstorm up north was my first thought which would have been the safe bet. But I saw no clouds past them. I then noticed the ghostly colors of the lights and realized I was watching the Aurora Borealis, which I was hitherto unaware could be seen from that far south. I took a moment to relax and enjoy it before scanning around me to see what other sights the moon would show me. It was then that I spotted, down below me in a flatter area, what appeared to be many numerous four-legged creatures cows, sheep, antelope, heck, even deer or elk wouldn't be that strange. I honestly couldn't tell you what they were, only that there were probably more than 20 and less than 50. More about that in a moment. But in the middle, I swore I saw an old school I kid you not covered wagon. Not the pioneer kind, but the blockier, 
fully roofed shepherd's hut on wheels that dotted Wyoming like freckles 120 years ago. Folks think it was the cattle that built the West, but Wyoming first and foremost was built on sheep. However, whatever I was seeing, it was all backlit by the moon, so they were casting shadows from the side facing me. Now, I'll be honest with y'all, I don't have the absolutely clearest vision. It's not bad, better with glasses, but I don't usually bring them with me to throw a leak in the middle of the night. So when I say the movement of these critters, and the wagon looks strange, I expect you to take it with a grain of salt. I expect you to say it had something to do with the aurora, or my eyes being tired, and those are all legit. Thankfully, I have really good hearing and olfactory perception. What my mediocre vision doesn't explain is why I was looking at something probably less than a mile away, and I couldn't hear it on a still night. Wagons are noisy. They creak worse than boats, even when new. Livestock are noisy, and I'd find it odd to see a group that size with no bells around their necks. Nothing. Silence. Furthermore, why would you try to travel by night? It was bright shore, but it's not like that's a common practice. At least not according to anything I've ever heard. You want your critters together and easily defended from predators, that's what I understand. I watched them for a while, moving slowly across the ground almost like they were underwater. Slow enough, I broke off a yucca stock and stuck it into the ground to mark the progress. Slow, but it was there. I stayed up there, watching the lights and the procession of shadows for a long time. Eventually, I decided to whistle at them. The two fingers in the mouth, super loud, angry dad whistle. I heard it echo back at me and then nothing. I yelled aloud, hello, at them as well. Echo and nothing again. Huh. No change in pace, no lights. I started to think the progress might be the moon moving across the sky, and not whatever I thought it was. So... I decided to go grab my binoculars and try to wake up Grace to at least see the lights. It was a little treacherous descending, but I made it in one piece. Camp was as I had left it, and I relaxed a little. I opened the tent flap and dug around a little, found my binoculars, but my attempts to rouse my lady friend were unsuccessful. She was not having it. Not at all. She rolled over and went back to sleep, and chastised. I went back up to the top of the dune. It took me a little longer this time. I was definitely feeling the climb by the time I got to the crest again. It looked like a little progress had been made, according to my yucca stock markers. Curious as heck, I decided to use the binoculars to try to make out what I was looking at. I couldn't find the shadows in the binoculars. There are two possible influences on that. One being these were old binoculars, and they had been stuck in maximum zoom since I had gotten them. The other would be it was in the wee hours of the morning, and I had, several hours earlier, imbibed some booze. But try and try again, nothing. I couldn't get eyes on the critters or the wagon. Couldn't hear them. Couldn't get a long-distance look at them. What was I to do? I said screw it, and went back to bed. Whatever I was looking at wasn't hurting me. It was just curious, and I had grown drowsy and cold lying on the cold sand. I marked the direction with one of the stock segments, slid down the dune on my butt, and crawled back into the tent. As I lay there, waiting for sleep in the warm and dark, I heard that gentle dune noise again, and the wind picked back up. My lullaby. Just as I was drifting off, though, I thought I heard a whistle echo across the sands, but from very far away. I put it down to my ears playing tricks on me, and when I next opened my eyes, it was morning. Problem was, I was sitting next to the still crackling fire, not in the tent, and Grace was leaning against me as we sat wrapped in a blanket. I know, I know. Screw you. This was just a dream, you jerk. I can hear you just fine. There are a few problems with that hypothesis, though. One was, I put out the fire before going to bed. I'm camping in a giant ashtray with a shovel in hand. It was effortless to put out, and I remembered doing so very clearly. Another was that I was wearing shoes, which I had made done to go relieve myself, and I hadn't done since we started the fire the night before, since I wanted a better grip on my baseboard to show Grace how to light a fire with a stick and bow. I have monkey feet. Judge away. Here's another. 
I could see my footsteps up the dune and the trail from my impromptu derriere sledding session. Okay. I woke Grace up, and she said that she thought we had slept in the tent. I concurred, and we sat there blearily blinking at a fire we didn't remember building. I asked her to start the coffee and climb back up the dune, this time with my compass and my binoculars. My yucca fragments were there, and I got a heading, scoping out where I thought they were the night before. Still didn't see anything that would have made sense, so I headed back down once more on the Butt Cheek Express and talked to my girlfriend about what I had seen. She wasn't particularly freaked out by any of it, confidently told me I was still asleep or sleepwalking when I saw lights in the bizarre caravan. She was a little concerned by the lost time and not remembering getting up, but I thank to her credit as a reasonable person. She thought I was winding her up. I wasn't offended. I was, however, racked by curiosity. What the heck had happened? I'm not a sleepwalker as far as I know, and I, as I am now, writing this, have lost time before out in the wilderness, but never before this incident. Was it just weird shadows? Had I been asleep? My markers were there, so I had been pretty lucid for a somnambulist. One simple test I thought of would confirm or deny it. I decided to throw on my boots and hike over to where I thought the trail should be by my best guess, while I let Grace do her morning routines. A short, brisk walk later, and I found nothing. No prints of any kind. This part wasn't as sandy as some others, so prints wouldn't have been everywhere, but there were none. Likelihood of sleep and booze fueled hallucinations increasing. I did a fairly thorough search of a few hundred yards in several directions, leaving my water bottle as a guide for where I thought it should be. No prints. I didn't give up. I trust my senses most of the time, and I'm stubborn. Also, I wasn't seeing anything that, given the angle of the moon, should have cast a shadow like that. Scrub, low brush, no trees, no boulders. I kept looking, first along the road I thought they would have cone from, no prints again. Something did catch my eye, though. In a less sandy patch, I saw a long stretch of depressed clay. A rut, I realized, and some mild depressions in the rock here and there. A rut from a wheel made of something harder than modern tires, with a less gentle suspension. Now that I was looking for it, I saw more here and there, headed to bisect the dunes from one grassland to the next. Just an old, old trail from long ago. I don't know what any of that was. I wasn't of sober or clear mind, although I was far from blackout drunk or sleep deprived. Grace got angry at me after a certain point of talking about it, so I stopped bringing it up. We finished out our outing. Our water collectors were successful in that they collected dew, and unsuccessful in that it was about a cup and a half from the three of them together. We made a bolo out of some rocks and yucca cordage. Pre-made, it's a process, and what we had made while we were there was minimal and strictly as a tutorial. We practiced at Latals, ruined some perfectly good flint in the attempt to make a pair of blades. We shared many good meals together. Still, overall a very pleasant trip. After another couple of uneventful nights, we headed home. I hadn't discussed it with anyone since, really. I have no good explanation. I have, however, been out there again, and while I've never seen anything like that again, twice in my recollection, I whistled at the top of the dunes. And later that night, I swore I heard one back. Probably just another camper. Probably. I had a self-rescue I had to do in the Laramie Peak Range. I lost my gear and map and shelter in a windstorm. Took a few days to get out. Had some deeply unpleasant experiences along the way. This isn't that story. It sucked, but it wasn't all that scary. I kept a cool head. Typically, that's who I am. I'm the person who stays calm in crisis. And I mention that to give you a litmus test for what it takes to freak me out. To make me lose my cool. This is about a time when I had all my gear, but I couldn't keep my cool. There are a lot of cool little trails in Colorado, some well-known, some only locals know. 
there are mountains and forests for days out there. In 2013, we got torrential downpours in September along the eastern slope. It was squelchy as crap for a while, and then a glorious mushrooming boom happened. I love mushrooms. I love to forage, take one leave three, and my absolute favorite is the Boletus rubriceps. The conditions weren't exactly right, but I thought, why not? I gave it a shot. I'm not saying where my spot is. I will say I also have the native hazel there, some actually fruiting manzanita, watermelon berry, currants, rose hips, raspberries, strawberries, and a frequently oysters, morals, hawk's wings, puffballs, the big ones in one meadow, milky caps, chicken of the woods and chicken of the road, and the only chanterelles I've found in the region, all in a glorious few acres. It's wonderful. I can disperse camp there. This is where I went, no brainer. Now it's fall, even if it's somewhat early fall. So I know that Yogi and Boo Boo are gonna be out stuffing it for the winter. So I've got my spray and my uncle's lever action 44 Mag Henry. GF at the time was supposed to come with, but couldn't get off work, so solo it was. I figured I could practice some firecraft, maybe build a chair, maybe a smoker, and in general, just have a nice few days out. I went up early in the morning, hiked about seven miles in, set up my shelter, set up to enjoy the rare luxury of a real fire in Colorado later, and started to do my stuff, set up a couple rods with bells, got out my baskets and set up my dryer and its shelter far away from my sleeping tarp shelter. I was squelching around with my foraging gear out in a few minutes and having a blast. I marched happily along pretty much until dusk and then pulled out my headlamp and kept going well past I should have. But did I get a haul? It was an incredible spread and I left plenty for the woodland critters. I got back to my camp, started cleaning and drying and probably didn't get to my dinner until one in the morning. I had caught two brook trout of reasonable size, gutted them and let them hang in a bug net nest of the creek for the next day. Figured it was cold enough that they'd be okay. I got back to my little dinky tarp shelter around 3 a.m. and went inside, toweled off, and passed out. I awoke around 10 a.m. or so the next day, and the woods were silent. I mean, no birds, no bugs. Wind in the branches. Nearby brook gurgling, and that's it. Usually there's something. I decided to be cautious and go about my business. My camp was exactly as I had left it except for two things. The first was there was a branch, about two feet long, thick as a wrist, laid against the tree my pack was tied to. It had been gnawed, like by a beaver on both ends, which I've heard of but have never seen before or since. It had no bark on it, but still was green wood. Had to have been left there, but to what end I have no idea. Unsettling? Sure. Freaky? Not really, I wasn't scared. Actually, my first thought was I must have picked it up and forgotten about it. And I put it out of my mind and went to collect my fish, which hopefully were still there and weren't rotten or nasty yet. I got into sight of them, or rather, the bug net they were in. They were gone. Bug net was loose but intact. It's the drawstring bag-shaped kind. And empty. And both fish heads were still hanging in there. But the rest of the fish were gone. Okay. Probably another person then. Someone is giving me the Scooby-Doo treatment. I had a bunch of charcoal from the fire, and there was a nice big rock next to my fishing spot. So I scrawled on there. If you're hungry, come say hi and I'll share my meal. With an arrow pointing roughly towards my camp. Grumpy more than unsettled now. I guess weird beaver branch is a trade for my fish. Whatever. I went to check on my drying shrooms and my berry cooler, and lo, and behold, everything under the tarp is untouched. However, I hadn't swept out any of the debris beneath it. Why bother? Well, now there was no debris beneath my tarp, just straight dirt and rocks. Weird again. I started looking more seriously for tracks and find nothing. Probably debris swept out from under my shelter was covering them. Not here to play junior detective. I'm here to frolic in the woodlands and collect responsible amounts of treasured forgeables. I shake it off, go back to the creek to set my lines again, 
and I notice my bells are gone. Okay. I couldn't remember if they had been there that morning or not, so I assumed they were taken the previous night. I had only tied the rods to the tree after all. It was easy grabbing. I went back to my tarp, made some food and coffee, shook it off, and went about my business. Now, here's the somewhat embarrassing thing. I know to make noise in the woods if bears can be around, and I like to sing. This isn't the same as singing well, or singing manly shanties and Viking epic poems. This is, by and large, singing whatever had been playing on the speakers at my job. So, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Florence and the Machine Lord. You get the picture. Also, I'm a bass. Whatever, don't judge me. Stuff is designed to be catchy. So, I went back on my rounds, and I found some fire morals or ash morals, which are a really rare treat. I was really excited. There are hundreds of them, and it's super late for them to show up. They're my favorite morals. I set about to collecting some, and kept myself company by singing. All right. I was singing Bad Romance, by one Stefani Germanata. I know. I got to the woo o o o part. If you've heard it, you know it. When I heard what sounded like someone harmonizing. Like I said, I'm a bass. But this was higher. Tenor or alto and muted by distance a little. It was also completely and undeniably wrong. Scratchy. Gravelly. Almost buzzy. Syllables weird and clipped and disjointed. And a little off-key and off-rhythm. Uncanny valley for sounds. I shut up immediately and froze. And it continued for a moment and then stopped. I was experiencing a little bit of what my friends always call pucker butt and started to slowly reach back behind for my Henry on its strap. And I heard a single sudden yelp or bark or something and some rustling from somewhere uphill of me behind the tree line. I take a few breaths, assuming I had freaked the other party out as much as they did me and force myself to relax. I keep small binoculars on me and I scanned the tree line, but I didn't see anything. I thought, this is probably whoever took my fish. Probably someone squatting out here. I'm going to keep my head on a swivel some. But if they were going to be a problem, I feel like they already would have confronted me or taken a pot shot or something. It also occurred to me, finally, that I could have just been hearing some weird echo. That thought gave me a little more peace and calm than I had a few minutes before. Although, it didn't explain the yelp, but normal animal activity does. Hooray rationalizing. I decide that that is enough morals, and I do not want to be drying them after dark, so I head back to camp and get to making that happen. Am I an idiot? Maybe. I really didn't want to go home. I love wet weather. I've grown up in high deserts my whole life, and getting to really see some green that late in the year is such a treat. I wanted to stay. I had had moments where my brain had tricked me before, and I talked myself into believing that it was happening again. I kept singing to myself more quietly than I was before, see as titanium, and it happens again. The weird, buzzy, higher voice joins in, again from a distance, and again, I feel the bottom drop out of my stomach. I know this probably just sounds creepy because I thought I was alone, but it's hard to convey how off-sounding this was. It was fairly close to what I had been singing, but like it was coming up out of culvert or something, and a few octaves higher, just as buzzy and hoarse sounding. If you've ever heard a tornado, or a parrot talking, or squeaking brakes, or a train whistle, you'll get a sense of the qualities this voice had. It's a pitch a human can emulate with their throat, but the texture and shape of the sound aren't really how we sound. Like that. I was not having it at all. I shut up immediately again, and this time got the Henry off my back and looked around me. I figured this had to be somebody messing with me. Not unheard of for good foraging spots. Look up the fights over huckleberry patches if you don't believe me. But definitely my first time. Again, the singing continued for a moment after I stopped. Again from uphill and further in the woods. And definitely in a direction I hadn't gone yet. I called out announced myself and asked them to answer please nothing tried again nothing silence again 
and since I'm listening, I notice it again. Just wind in the trees in the creek. No animal noises. No bugs. My head had felt a little squeezy, so I decided I needed to check the weather when I was sure I wasn't going to get shot IR something. Maybe a storm was rolling in. Bingo. I had headed over to a clearing, and for sure, storm was rolling in. As always, hard to judge speed. But it wasn't a bad idea to see about reconfiguring my tarp and having an early bedtime. Again, a little more at peace, since I figure any more crap from my apparent neighbor is going to be less likely. I went back to my fishing rods, lucked out, and found I had caught a bigger trout than the night before. I gutted it, cooked it, and ate it on the spot. Those of you in the know know it's hard to beat. I collected some water for the next day, packed up my foraging stuff and lashed it all to trunk, and decided to call it there before dusk was on its way in. I set up my tarp in a lower to the ground, more wind-resistant configuration, and set up a spare, older one as a kind of rain fly over the entrance. It's worth noting that this was an old, lightweight, silver-colored nylon backpacking tarp, fairly thin set up facing the clearing, since likely the worst wind would be coming from there. It also pretty much blocked my view of the clearing. I did another Widowmaker check, all good, made a hot cocoa and tucked in just as it was starting to come down. It came down hard. I had to put in some earplugs. Lightning was frequent and loud, and I didn't stay particularly dry and didn't get much sleep. It was, all in all, one of the most unpleasant and awe-inspiring nights I had had camping. Somewhere in the middle of the night, I thought I heard, felt something bounce off my tarp, kind of behind me. Well, not that weird. It happens in storms. Figured it was a branch. Then a few minutes later, I see something, maybe a stone, about the size of a plum bounce off of my tarp, off the rain fly and land in front of me. I get my headlamp turned on, and sure as crap, it's a rock, round but not symmetrical or spherical, and smooth, a river rock. Rocks don't fall off trees as a rule, and if this storm had picked one this round up, I should have been airborne. Then another one a few minutes later, similar trajectory, then nothing but the storm for a while. What am I going to do? Investigate and get soaked? I had my gun, and if crap was going to go down, I was about as ready as I could be. I turned my headlamp back off. I then got treated to pretty much the most awe-inspiring amount of lighting I have ever seen in my life. The sky is lit up for seconds at a time. The earplugs were not protecting me from the thunder, and my ears are ringing. I keep seeing the trees from the edge of the tree line, and the clearing projected in shadow form, onto my rain fly over and over again dancing this way and that. It was really beautiful, and if kind of inherently scary, also exhilarating. I really couldn't look away. Then, pretty clearly, I saw what looked like a person, walking along the tree line, outlined against the trees and my rain fly by the lightning. They were walking weirdly, not running from cover to cover, but just kind of strolling a little unsteadily, like a drunk person. The silhouette wasn't bulky, and for some reason I got the impression they weren't wearing clothes. Or if they were, it was very, very tight. Not like rain gear. They stopped, and whether or not they were facing me or the clearing, I couldn't tell you. But I felt watched and very exposed. The figure stood, swaying a little, probably being pushed around by the winds, and just looked at whatever they were looking at. I got little glimpses here and there as the lightning flashed, but they didn't appear to be moving much. It was pretty freaky, and I didn't move except to get my gun in front of me. Then I had another rock land on my tarp, bounce off and land in front of me. That was a bad moment. Lightning had stopped for a bit, and the thunder had died down for a moment. I had horrible, slow realization that I was very likely surrounded. Then I heard, cutting through the ringing in my ears and momentary silence, clear as it had been earlier but sounding much closer. The chorus from Titanium from behind my tarp. If you didn't know the words, here they are. I'm bulletproof, nothing to lose, fire away, fire away. Ricochet, you take your aim, fire away, fire away. Then nothing. I looked back towards the front and realized I didn't see that figure projected by the lightning anymore. 
now that there was a lull in the lightning. I remember thinking, crap, 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 just over and over again. I basically was going to have to crawl out of my tarp to get on my feet, and there was pretty much no way I was going to stay in my shelter anymore. I counted down from ten, and then pushed myself out, and got to my feet, Henry in hand, and let out the loudest yell I could. I think I said something like, knock it off, I'm armed, screw off. I was not in a good headspace. I was about as freaked out as I had ever been up to this point, and this was not all that long after the deer thing I mentioned in my other post. I was about ready to crap myself. I looked around the back of my tent with my light and didn't see anything. Nobody. Just rain pissing down. I walked around the front of my tarp. Nobody. I could clearly see into clearing until my light got swallowed up by the rain. I walked around the edge of my little camp, sticking close to my tarps, and I didn't see anybody. I wish I could say I checked out the tree line for footsteps, but I didn't. I tried to yell again and my voice was completely in my throat. Another rock hit my shelter and bounced off, squarely in the cone of my headlamp. And I won't lie to you all, I lost it. I fired my Henry into the dirt, about ten feet in front of me, and I heard some immediate rustling in the woods uphill from me again. I yelled some dumb panic stuff, and though I don't know why, I ducked into my tarp again, wrapped up as much as I could and huddled up with my gun. Eventually the storm broke, followed by dawn, and I got up to pack up my crap and get out of there. I was pretty shaky, and it took me a while to get my various gear all in hand and brought up to my shelter. I took a few moments to gather up the round river stones and I noted I didn't see any like this even in the creek, and definitely none sitting around the ground. The debris is too thick. My shelter was the farthest back thing in the woods of the various stations around the camp, except for my pack, which had a garbage bag over it. When I went around back the tarp to grab it, there were two more little sections of sapling, green wood, chewed looking ends, barked stripped again just like before leaning against the trunk below it. Nope. Not okay. It took me a second to go get my pack. I was that freaked out that I was now afraid of sticks. One my first night and two the second? Nope. Screw that. I finally got myself under control and went to grab my pack. And again, I had a powerful sense of being watched. I shook off the cover, packed it in Q dry bag, and turned around to get my stakes out of the ground and pick up my tarp. There was a whole ripped open dead rabbit on the back edge of my tarp. The rain had washed off any blood that would have been on it, but the carcass was just splayed out there, like it had landed on it after being thrown and then slid down the slope of it. It was fresh enough it didn't stink, and the digestive tract hadn't been punctured. I was instantly and totally numb. Mental dial tone. I picked it up with a stick, dropped it on my swamped out fire pit, yanked my tarp out of the ground one stake at a time, balled it up, yanked my rain fly out of its lashings hard enough to rip it, grabbed the rest of my crap, loosely shoved it all in my pack, put my Henry so it hung in front of me, and power walked and jogged my way out of there until I couldn't anymore, and breathlessly walked the rest of the way to my car. I got in, drove about 20 minutes, and then had to pull over to throw up a few times and have a panic attack. I have never been back there alone, and definitely not unarmed. Even then, I only went back in 2017. I still can't listen to that song without feeling sick. I know, rationally, that it was probably squatters, or somebody up there messing with me. But the same question keeps coming up. Why didn't they need lights? Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep everyone, and I'll read to you in the next video.
Bye-bye now.